We now take it to the broadcast of It's Time with Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. My name is Reverend Nathaniel Wayne Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in the city of Los Angeles. We're located at 8916 South Main Street. And we welcome you to come and worship with us at any and all times uh, on Sundays. We're there on Sundays from 10 o'clock. And we're there on uh, Wednesdays nights and Friday night. We're going to be there tonight. Matter of fact, if you'll come by, and we'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, myself and Pastor uh, Della F. Holliness, she was kind enough to open the doors of her church to welcome me and my congregation in to join with them. And we're having a wonderful time in the name of Jesus. And we when the Baptists and the Charismatics get together, you get a double dose of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we have to offer you in love, uh, love, love, love. And uh, we would invite you to come and worship with us at any and all of our services. However, this offering that we are doing right now that you're watching is entitled, It's Time. And the question says, what is it time for? And well, May you ask, because it is time, it is past time for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Yes, environmental justice. Look at how we are degrading our planet, how we're polluting the air, how we are polluting the water. And uh, who suffers for that? Well, first of all, it is the poor. And who are the poorest? Why, it is always the blacks in America who are the poorest, who are on the, still on the bottom rung. Uh, after night, even after 1968, we're still uh, languishing, as I speak, in the corners of American society, quoted from Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, speech at the I Have a Dream that folks like to talk about. And so, yes, we need environmental justice. After all, who who gave us the bottoms to live in? That's environmental justice. You always put down at the bottom. That means if you're up on the hill and it rains and water coming down where you at, you stand in the bottom. So now your, your house is going to get flooded. And these type of things uh, blacks have historically uh, been subjected to by our uh society, by the laws, by the statutes, uh, by the ordinances on the federal, state, county, and local level. So we're still languishing uh, to get out from under all of those things. When you talk about uh, black people being homeless, how did they get that? This is the consequence. This is a result of all of those uh, years of redlining and all of those centuries of Jim Crow and all of those uh, years uh, when the suburbs were being built for the white people, but the white black people were excluded. And so now you have a housing crisis, and a lot of the uh, housing uh, people who are unhoused are black. And unfortunately for our white brothers and sisters now, some of them are becoming unhoused, <laughs> unsheltered. And... Uh, this must be addressed. Black people make up, according to the uh, supervisor, Mark Riley Thomas, we make up 10% of the population, but we make up 40% of the homeless people here in Los Angeles County. However, before I get too far gone, with environmental justice, we must have uh, health, justice, health. Our health outcomes are very poor. Uh, the health disparities, and all of this is a lot of time is the effect of inst institutionalized racism. It's not just that the doctor uh, may not be president, but that the very institution that he works at or that she works at, the nurses and the technicians, right down to the machinery that they use, may, be, may have bias programmed into that uh, software equipment so that our outcomes are not uh, the same uh, for the most part 
as our white, so-called white brothers and sisters, so that if a healthy uh, black woman goes in to have a baby, she is far more likely to have uh, medical challenges than her white sister. And then, of course, we come to economic justice, which must always include reparation. And uh, we're going to put, keep preaching about reparation until reparations becomes a reality and a fact in American life. I read for you our scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. It says, And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let them go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let them go away empty. Thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto them. And to furnish means to provide, it means to supply. Uh, so it was in God's plan that um, nobody should work as a slave or in that type of uh, condition because of their misfortune and then be turned away empty, but that they should uh, in love, the people that they have labored for should have uh, mercy and grace and kindness upon them and in uh, furtherance of their own uh, godliness share uh, with their brothers and with their sisters, which brings us squarely back to the question of reparations from slavery. I have with me today a good friend of mine who was with me a few weeks ago when I had a doctor's appointment. He and Sister Gloria Martin took care of things. He's a very astute, very knowledgeable, very informed advocate, activist, social justice uh, fighter. His name is Reverend Jeff Logan. Brother Jeff, how you doing? I call you Reverend. I didn't mean to say Reverend. I'm giving you. <laughs> I want you to be. I'm giving you social activism. But I, uh, we great to have you here. Much respect. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. And we want you to tell us uh, more about the uh, America descendants of slavery, and uh, you know, just bring us into this why we need this reparations and who should get. Uh, this reparation. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, yeah, and just like the Reverend said, how you guys doing? My name is Jeff Logan. Um, my second time on the broadcast. Um, last time we talked about reparations, we'll still dig in on this time too, mm -hmm. but I would like to, of course, talk about ADOS, American Descendants of Slavery. Now, last week I mentioned Foundation of Black Americans specific, um, but I wanted to go ahead and make some clarifications. ADOS is Foundation of Black American. So it's synonymous. So if you hear anybody talking about American descendants of slavery, they're talking about foundational black Americans. If you hear anybody talking about foundational black Americans, it's ADOS, American descendants of slaves. And it has to be that specific only because there are a lot of people that were enslaved around the globe. However, our unique uh, specific history was here in America. And so it was us. Uh, uh, that have the lineage that goes through the killing fields of America that says it was us specifically and no one else, no other group, us specifically that are owed the reparations. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear somebody say that, that the uh, American descendants of the slaves here in the United States of America are the ones that directly need those reparations. That's Isn't right. that right? That's right. Okay, I'm very good. Just like the Japanese received reparations, and uh, just like the Jews coming out of the so-called Holocaust received reparations, we blacks who uh, were born uh, and, and reared here in the United States, our daddy not from Kenya and our mama not from Ireland, we we from Mississippi and Alabama. <laughs> exactly, down south. <laughs> At all points across this great nation. We are the ones who need to get the reparations. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Absolutely. Uh, can I expand on that just a little bit? Sure. So with ADOS, the term ADOS, the hashtag and the term uh, 
our brother, our beautiful uh, sister and our beautiful brother, um, Yvette Carnell and Antonio Moore, they are the ones who came up with that particular term. Mm -hmm. um, but they are, of course, ADOS. They're foundational black Americans as well. And so the new voices of black media include them as well. So last week I named Jason Black, Tariq, and um, Professor Black Truth of the new voices of black media. But I don't want to leave out our brother Antonio Moore and our sister um, Yvette Carnell, mm -hmm. both of which are pushing... Um, for uh, what our particular claim is and what we're owed as opposed to immigrants and all these other groups that uh, seem to always get resources and benefits right over the head of us. So they're leading on that. Um, and speaking of ADOS, we're actually going to be having a foundational Black American convention next year in Atlanta. Um, that's going to be ran by Tariq. Um, and that particular convention, we're going to be going into things that will help us directly, um, specifically and directly. Like, for instance, we're, the Reverend mentioned the mortality rate being higher among black women. And that's going around. And that that really concerns me. Um, so during the co uh, convention or the conference that we're going to be having in 2020, we'll be going over on how we can get black midwives to help curb this mortality rate, death rate so that we can actually have our children keep them here. Um, we'll also be talking to black lawyers to see how we can go ahead and combat this systematic thing on a court system side. Uh, they're going to have black holistic doctors th there to, you know, just to make sure that black people have an equal chance um, versus everybody else. So we've seen who's been taking the brunt force of the uh, subjugation, and it's always been us. And there's a hierarchy of of, of racists, and it, all, it starts at the top where the white supremacists are. The next line, it's uh, Asians, and then it's down to Arabs, then it's Hispanics, and then we're always at the very, very, very bottom. And so back to is us specifically, foundational black Americans, American descendants of slaves, also, you'll hear Claude Anderson, he, he before anyone was saying anything, he was saying native blacks, um, but they all mean the same thing. And the reason why I chose to use the, the term foundational black Americans as opposed to um, American descendant of slavery is only because it has the word black in it. No one can co-op it and take it and change it into something else. There are immigrants right now that are trying to get in the conversation uh, uh, for the reparations that are owed to us under the guise of Caribbean descendant of slaves or uh, African descendant of slaves, which is different from American descendant of slaves. And uh, we should make sure that we always know the difference. Right. So what you're saying that uh, we must not lose the focus on the 250 years of unrequited toil that I've Four parents, slave four parents, uh, contributed to the building of this nation. Is that right? Yep, that's right. All right. And whatever the other countries are asking for or demanding, it does not impact what we are asking for or demanding because we are dealing with what we had to uh, suffer uh, and we still languish under the effects. And uh, I, I get what you're saying, because sometimes the other uh, nations, uh, other countries, uh, whether they be Jamaica or B Barbados or Haiti or even Belize, small as that is, uh, because of their uh, because of their participation or because that they too were settled uh, by slavery, uh, they may feel that they should come and. Uh, have a share in our total. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And I think that's very, very problematic. And it's problematic because those people are allowing themselves to be used as bootlicks or tools for the right supremacists to undermine us and our pro progress every time. Um, the movie Harriet just came out. Mm -hmm. Now, we know Harriet Tubman is an, an American descendant or a, a, a was a slave. So she was that slave, an American slave in slavery. So she's the foundation. So they have uh, this woman who is a Nigerian Brit, a British Nigerian, um, playing Harriet. Her name is Cynthia Arrivo. Oh, I haven't seen the movie yet. So Right. So Cynthia Arrivo, it's not, you ain't going to miss anything. Trust me. 
Mm-hmm. Nothing you want to even see. Only because the way they spat in our sister's face with this movie, they basically created a character that never existed in real life. They made a big black man, by the way, called Bigger Long. They made Bigger Long, okay, the the subject of the entire movie, chasing, and he's supposed to be the bloodthirsty slave, uh, slave catcher, a slave slave catcher. Mm-hmm. Which never never existed. They didn't trust black people to give them guns like that. They thought they would get blown away. And so they just basically, in the movie, in a nutshell, they made the movie to where white folks did not feel uh, threatened. And then black people watching it did not feel threatened by the white people in, you know, in slavery. They were good white people because then there was a white savior that ended up saving Harriet in the movie, which is very, very, very problematic for people watching that. Oh. So this is why we don't we, we need to make sure that we, we need to vet make our these own movies, man. Exactly. We need to make our own movie, tell our own story. Exactly. Because you cannot expect the your slave master, your slave oppressor, to make himself look bad. Right. <laughs> so right. it would have been better if they just stuck with Wakanda. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. They can keep that one too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it's they. In other words, they made a caricature out of a character. That's correct, and it just really just didn't. You know, she it didn't do justice to Harry Tubman. In other words, no. There in was your a, opinion, in my opinion, no. Mm-hmm. There was a bootleg version going on online, and you know, we were able to see a clip of it. And she, her acting skills are very subpar. She's not that good. I would love to see who they auditioned uh, first mm-hmm. before they chose her. Now, that's not saying that. Um, some of our immigrant brothers and sisters wouldn't play us or do us good, but she was terrible. And then on top of that, she was caught on social media, basically talking reckless about foundational black Americans, calling us kind of ghetto and like, as if we speak a certain way and mocking us. And then found out later that she's friends, really good friends with another British Nigerian called Lovey. And Lovey got her stardom, and she'll tell you it's on YouTube. She got her stardom writing on why black Americans should not receive reparations. So when the white media seen that she was writing writing that against black Americans, they propped her up. And now she's doing all kinds of lectures all around the country right now. And that is Cynthia Arrivo, her friend, who played our sister Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. So it's a slap in the face so many different ways, so many different times. And that's why we have to vet these immigrants. We have to uh, basically demand respect. When they come over here, they got to respect us because we made it possible. And if they don't respect us, they can't they can't talk or speak for us who they're what they're which they're trying to do. Which we should always be speaking for ourselves. Exactly. Uh, We don't need any uh, foreign folks people telling our story. It's time for us to tell the story because we're in the best position to tell the story because we're the ones who suffered. And we're the ones who are still suffering. That's right. And we're the ones who yet uh, language. Uh, however, I do like to uh, give a uh, encouragement report that there is a movement afoot to make the universities uh, begin to pay uh, and acknowledge pay reparations and acknowledge uh, their role in slavery. Because most of our major University was founded by slave owners, slave holders, their professors, their uh, deans, uh, all of their uh, vicars and preachers, whether you Episcopalian or Presbyterian or Catholic, even they were all slave owners and slave holders. And uh, so even in the church of that day, uh, uh, you had uh, the validation and uh, of the institution of the domestic institution of slavery uh, here in the 13 colonies. Not to forget that uh, when the colonies were uh, initially uh, organized or founded, even as a loose uh, coalition of 13 colonies, all of those colonies were slave colonies, whether it was Boston, uh, whether it was Rhode Island, or whether it was New York, or whether it was New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut, you hear those names? Those are northern names. But they were all uh, had slaves. They all trafficked in slavery. They all made their money in the slave trade. They, some of them built, some of those people there built ships and sailed those ships back to the continent of Africa to make their living 
uh, in catching, kidnapping, uh, 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 and enslaving uh, Africans. And uh, they are all uh, complicit and all guilty uh, in the uh, institution of slavery as it existed here in uh, this country. And so uh, Harvard University has been singled out uh, by uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Antigua. His name is Prime Minister Gaston Brown. And he says one of his statements is, uh, rever the reparation that we're asking for is not aid, it is not welfare, it is not a gift, it is compensation to correct the injustices of the past and restore equity. Harvard should be in the forefront of this effort. This is an excerpt from uh, Prime Minister Brown's letter uh, that he wrote to the uh, president of Harvard and also his uh, subsequent uh, interviews, press release that he gave to uh, the media. I'd like to get your reactions to that. Absolutely. I'm all for that. I love the way that sounds. Um, I think that uh, we as American descendants of slavery should make sure that we stay on top of that. We stay in the forefront of it. And the only way that we could actually make some something like this pop, we talk about reparations from universities or reparations from the government, is that we have a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. We need a code of conduct that ties us together as a group, which is... ADOS, which is foundational black Americans because it's all lineage, but even more than that, black empowerment has to be kind of our everyday get down. Um, and what that means is, a, so if you see somebody speaking against reparations um, and they're black, right then and there is a red flag. These people are off code. So that person can't go into office now and then begin to speak for us off top. So I just think that, you know, as long as we have a code of conduct and make sure that they're talking about specifically us, that we have the best chance of making sure that it actually gets to us. And I like the way that they put that. We're old. We want compensation. So it was very specific, very to the point, And I'm with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a, it's not welfare. It's not aid. This country was founded on slavery. This country was its profit was slavery. It, it's commodity. Uh, was slavery. It's it, it, what it was trafficking in was slavery, and it used that slavery to build wealth untold uh, for the slave owners. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sean uh, Rochester said in his book, the uh, slavery was a 100% tax against black tax. the black body because you got nothing for you. Everything you got went to Somebody else. You were sweating, as the Bible said, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat brown, but shalt thou eat bread. But we did not eat the bread. We were sweating, but the white boss was eating the bread. <laughs> you know, because no. we didn't get the benefit from that cotton. No. Or, or from any of the other crops uh, that we were forced and compelled. And in uh, uh, the, the uh, administration of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, uh, you see the. the uh, the uh, unfairness of the slaveocracy, where the slaves were forced to help build those buildings. They built Monticello. They built the White House. Uh, they laid out uh, Washington, D.C. and the like. All of those things our people did, you know. And uh, for the most part, it was uncompensated. You, you didn't get paid. The slaves certainly didn't get paid uh, for their labor. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson has some nice things to say to uh, Benjamin Banneker in one of his letters, although he was very sternly, very sternly, cruelly uh, believed that all black people were inferior, all Negroes were inferior, even though, of course, he uh, fathered several children by a young lady <laughs> that he started going with when she was 14 years old, had her come over to Rome, I mean, over to, yeah, to Paris, Paris, France, uh, and everything. So uh, he was as as uh, 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 he engaged in what you call cognitive dissonance. Uh, he was as hypocritical uh, in his uh, life and in his living as the nation. 
that uh, he helped to found, you know, because they were saying freedom, but they were practicing slavery. Right. right. They were talking about all men are equal, but they were delving into the three-fifths clause and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, the how could you have? Uh, someone said that there was two nations. One nation of slaves. The other nation uh, believed in uh, uh, open market labor. And you, he was trying to stitch the slave country together with the free market uh, country. And it just wouldn't hold. Just not wouldn't sustain. So we got the five minute warning. I want to uh, notify and alert our viewers, our listeners, and our supporters. Please hit that up, that thumbs up button. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, make sure you were keenly aware that uh, Princeton University uh, last month in the month of uh, October. They pledged $27 million in reparation. You know, Princeton University was built uh, by slave owners, slaveholders, plantation owners. That's where they sent their kids. There's no, it was no, no shame in their game. <laughs> uh, Is that Princeton? That's Princeton. We talked about Harvard, but now we got Princeton. Princeton. That's the one I read upon. They are pledging $27 million. Uh, in the form of scholarships and other initiatives to assist descendants of slaves. Uh, you see how they, they didn't put that word before descendants of slaves? Right. They left that out, and they also should have put, if you read down there, should have say, and other unrepresented groups. Who was that? Right. Now, that's, so, that's very murky. Exactly. Uh, but uh, the point should be stressed, and it's got to be continually stressed, that it was slaves that American slaves slaves. that built Princeton. Not only built it uh, physically with their hands, but their, their labor and their sale uh, was the financing for those universities. See, those universities were financed directly by slavery, the proceeds from slavery, the profit from slavery. Uh, as a matter of fact, another university that I mentioned, I think, some time ago, Georgetown University, uh, I don't see it here right now, but Georgetown uh, University uh, found out that in, uh, I forget what year it was, 272 of their slaves were sold in order that that uh, university would be, would continue in its existence. Uh this is on Harvard. But uh, all of these things are interrelated and they must not be uh, forgotten. And we must not uh, trivialize our suffering or the pain of our brothers and our sisters. Uh, because Harvard not only was in the slave trade, but after the slave was over, they propagated and, and perpetuated the uh, false... Uh, education doctrine of white supremacy and inferiority of black people uh, they because they were the leading uh, university in the nation at that time and so the harm that has been done to our people is immeasurable because we suffered for generations under this false uh, science pseudoscience false education that was perpetrated by uh, so-called learned doctors Closing remarks from our good friend, Dr. Jeff Logan. Oh, he's a doctor now. He started out a rebel, now he's a doctor. Closing remarks from our good friend, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff Logan. Absolutely. I would just encourage people to, you know, you. it all starts with research and everything yourself. Um, there's a movie coming out next year sometime made by Tariq again. Uh, I always talk about him because he got so many films um, that we should be all look at. Wrap it up. And... Um, with our families, but he got a new video coming out. It's called Buck Breaking, and it goes into the feminization, the feminization of black men. We need to get on that. We need to have a code of conduct. American descendants of slaves, reparations specifically for us. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, as I all close out, I say to you again, as we're talking about labor and work, remember slavery was about labor. Slavery was about labor on the fact that you didn't get paid for your labor. And so as you face these 
uh, days of these corporations, these companies that are making trillions and billions of dollars on the stock market, but yet they only want to pay you kibbles and bits. Listen, if they don't want to pay you, follow Dr. Martin's advice. Don't work for them. God bless you. Thank you, Doc. We're out of here.